All right, it is five minutes after five and we've been holding steady with um, I think 18 guests for a few minutes now. So I will go ahead and get started. Um, introductions first, um, I'll introduce myself and then I will ask Estrella to introduce herself. Um, and I will ask Estrella up front to please insert your uh, perspectives at any point so that I don't just ramble on and on and not give you a chance to speak because your contribution is super important to tonight's discussion. Shannon McCauley is running our webinar behind the scenes. She'll be answering some questions um, directly. Um, she's doing that now, as a matter of fact. Um, so even though we can't see her, I'm grateful for her being here and making things run smoothly. So my name is Lisa Broom. I am the Associate Director of the Honors Program and the Director of Academic Advising in the program. Estrella. Hi everyone, my name is Estrella. Um, I just graduated from U of M. I majored in history and minored in museum studies. I was part of the Honors Program since my very first day here. I did the sophomore Honors Award, meaning that I was very involved in Honors for two years, and I stepped out, did not do the thesis. Um, I did it through my minors, not through my major, through Honors, but I still had a ton of support from Honors and stayed really engaged in the community. I've worked orientation for the last four years, and so if you have any questions about, you know, your child's scheduling or what's it like in soft quad or anything like that, I'd love to talk to you about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, today, we will cover a lot of topics. Um, and as I said at the outset, um, and this is especially for those of you who hadn't joined when I first said, um, please enter your questions in the Q&A at any point. Um, it's more important that you get your questions answered than, uh, than that I just you know keep talking um, and run roughshod over, over your important questions. So the goals for this session are to understand the mission of the LSA Honors Program, and then we'll break it down into some nuts and bolts. What are the LSA degree requirements and how does the Honors Program help a student meet those requirements? Um, in one sense, I'll be talking about the benefits of the program um, as, a, as an excellent way of meeting those college degree requirements. We will talk about the Sophomore Honors Award opportunity. It's not a requirement, but it's a wonderful thing for students to pursue. So we'll describe that in some detail. Um, we'll talk about what it means to graduate with honors, how to do it. Um, there are multiple paths to graduating with honors. Um, as always, Q&A. We will talk a bit about housing and the focus in that portion of today's presentation will be mostly on the programming. Um, Shannon is already answering some questions about move-in dates. Um, it's important to know that housing controls most of housing, um, but what we have some, some lovely um, control over and input into is the community building programming that we do within and outside of housing. Um, so I'll talk about that. And then I will also talk about honors advising, including orientation. And before we conclude, I will give you some very important, absolutely essential information about FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. But before I launch into the rest of the presentation, um, I'll say that over the past year, um, things have changed at some point slowly and uh, more recently very quickly. So the university is providing updates on a regular basis at the website you see here on the left side. Um, it's called Maze and Blueprint and the link is provided there for you. Um, Honors also keeps updates um, on its website. Uh, we update as quickly as we can and the link is there for you. It's our Honors FAQ page. Um, so you may want to check into those sites throughout the summer, especially Maze and Blueprint, if there are questions outside of honors, uh, you know, about what might be changing. Um, okay, honors staff and introductions. I've introduced myself, but I would like to introduce you virtually to our director, Professor Mika Levick Manti. He's our faculty director. He is a Thurnau Professor of Political Science, and he also has a joint appointment in philosophy. 
the Thurnau Professorship is a distinguished professorship um, awarded to faculty who demonstrate excellence in many ways, but in, particularly in teaching. So we're really fortunate to have Mika as our faculty director. Mika is teaching a course in honors this fall, a first year writing course, which carries social science credit called wellness. So there is an opportunity for your students to take a course with Mika as early as this term. Um, he is also hosting sessions um, like this, not a webinar, but an actual um, small group discussion with students who are coming to orientation each week. So there's a great chance that your student will have a chance to interact with Mika in a small group this summer. And then all of us are participating in various summer activities like our summer reads program um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. So there are multiple opportunities to interact with our staff throughout the summer and especially our director. Okay, also pictured here, Gail Green, our Assistant Director for Admissions and Honors Housing. Gail and Shannon work very closely together um, throughout the admissions cycle um, and throughout orientation and into the early fall. So you may have already corresponded with Gail or with Shannon if you had questions about admissions or housing. Um, and again, Shannon is the person behind the scenes tonight. Henry Dyson, um, also on the slide here is the director of the Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships. In our office, we refer to that um, shorthand ONSF. The Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships um, is homed within honors, but it provides a service to students throughout the entire university, all 19 schools and colleges. The Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships helps students identify and apply for competitive awards. These are awards mostly for postgraduate study, but sometimes for um, continued undergraduate study. These are scholarships and fellowships that reward excellence in particular ways. The awards that come to mind, and there are many of them, so I'll just name a few. Um, the Rhodes Scholarship for study at Oxford, the Marshall Scholarship for study at other institutions of higher learning in the United Kingdom. The Goldwater Scholarship, which provides very nice funding for sophomores and juniors who have already built a record of excellence in STEM research. So those are just three examples. And as I said, there are many other opportunities out there. Um, but we're really pleased to have Henry and the office um, and Katie, the program assistant in ONSF, embedded within honors because we know honors students are often um, eager to pursue those opportunities. More introductions. We have a wonderful administrative staff um, who you see pictured here. Barb Frecka is our administrative coordinator. She assists students in lots of ways. Um, enrollment management for one, she is also a financial guru as she will disburse awards that we make to students. And one of the benefits of being in the honors program is that we have special uh, research and travel and project grant opportunities that students can apply for. So Barb would be their point of contact if they're awarded some funding. Jerry Preston, who you see here is our engagement coordinator. She is responsible not only for planning a lot of the wonderful activities that we host throughout the academic year and in the summer to build community, but also our communications. Every Monday throughout the academic year, we send a newsletter called This Week in Honors. Jerry is the editor of that newsletter um, and she does many, many other things as well as coordinate Parents and Family Weekend, which we are planning right now. Jacqueline Turkovich, our academic auditor. I am really pleased to say that Honors is a full service advising unit, meaning we have our own academic auditor who helps students make sure that they are on track, meeting all the requirements that they need in order to graduate. Um, Jacqueline carries the university bulletin in her head. It's very impressive. Um, so it's, we're just fortunate to have her on our team, helping our students stay on track. 
academic advisors. We are college advisors in the honors program, meaning that we are a student's academic business center or home, and we are able to help them plan their schedules, to think about their goals and their dreams, to help them with special academic requests or business they might need transacted. Um, so we work on the college level, and I'll talk later about how departments have their own advisors and how that all works. But what I want to point out here are three exceptionally talented advisors on our team. Dr. Stephanie Chervin, our pre-health advisor. She is ace at managing the data that's necessary to assist our students in applying for medical school. Dr. Denise Guillot, pre-law advisor. Um, equally talented in helping our students find their ways into law programs. And John Cantu, academic advisor, who's been in our program for a long, long time. So he has lots of institutional memory and tr tremendously good advice. Okay, now let me pause and see about some questions um, before I continue. Um, can you also take courses in Ross Business School while you're in LSA? Yes, um, there are some limitations, but it is certainly possible to do that. And there will be a point in our presentation where I can address that in slightly greater detail. Um, for students in HSSP and honors, how do these programs work together? HSSP um, is a living and learning community. If a student participates in the Health Science Scholars Program, um, we celebrate that. We help them make sure they're meeting requirements in both programs. Um, we love it when students participate in two learning communities because they're making friends in both, they're making faculty connections in both, um, and they're really taking a deep dive in something that they care about and are academically interested in. So there should never be a conflict. It should always be a dovetailing and a, a benefit. Um, and we remain in really good contact with the HSSP uh, program coordinators so that we're all on the same page. Um, will the scheduling of classes accommodate both? Yes. Um, students will have to make some choices um, simply because they can't be in two places at one time, even in Zoom world but we as advisors work with them to make sure that their schedules work out well to accommodate both um, programs. Okay, what is the LSA Honors Program? So I've already said we're a full service advising unit and I'll come back to that, but I wanna start with the big picture. We are a program that really supports the mission of the college in its um, effort to provide the best liberal arts education at any public university. The honors program helps students take an even deeper dive into their, their liberal arts education. Um, and the program is really designed for students who are, as the slide says, intellectually curious, who want to explore different areas of the liberal arts, even if they have a preference or a direction when they enter, they're still keen to learn about many things. Um, the program is designed for students who want to make a very large liberal arts college feel like a smaller home. And we do that through our academic programming and our co-curricular and community programming. LSA honor students will meet college requirements um, in some creative ways. We have our own curriculum and I will talk about the curriculum in a little more detail in just a few minutes. Um, but the curriculum dovetails very nicely with the college requirements so that we never slow a student down in terms of time to graduation. We actually enhance it a little bit. The honors program is not a college in its own right. We are a program within the college of LSA. So if a student were to be in engineering, they would have their own honors program. We are the honors program within LSA. Um, obviously not all students in LSA are members of the honors program. Uh, your student was admitted 
through our application process. And we're really delighted to have them join us this fall. Um, we're, we're excited about meeting them in person in the fall. All honors program students meet the same requirements for the Bachelor of Science and the Bachelor of Arts um, degrees as all other LSA students. We think they just have a more exciting route to do that. Okay, what are these degree requirements to which I refer? All LSA students must earn at least 120 credits in order to graduate. And what we know is that if a student takes a, an average of 15 credits per semester for eight semesters, they will earn that 120, those 120 credits. Um, typically courses are three or four credits. And so it really just matters, you know, how the math works out as to how many classes a student would take per semester. Oftentimes, honor students will bring in credit from prior study. And by that, I mean AP coursework and exams, IB coursework and exams, or dual enrollment, um, perhaps taking classes at a community college or an institution near their home. So sometimes an honor student will come in with a semester's worth of credit, and that may make a difference as to how soon they can graduate um, or whether they want to stay longer and explore more. But we advisors will talk with them really carefully about those plans. About 20% of what a student will do in their time at Michigan in LSA is to focus on college requirements. All students must do a first year writing course and an upper level writing course. Honors offers first year writing courses in its curriculum, and they are special because they also carry distribution credit. And I'll talk about distribution in just a matter of seconds. But no other first year writing course at the university doubles up on writing and distribution. So that's what I mean when I say the honors program has some special opportunities that help a student meet these requirements. Um, if a student chooses to write an honors thesis, they are exempt from taking an upper level writing course. Um, so that's another special benefit and opportunity within honors. All LSA students must take a quantitative reasoning course or courses. And throughout orientation, we'll talk with students about the ways that they can meet that requirement. It's very easily assumed that math is the only way that can be done, but it's not the case. Statistics is a really great option for doing it, but even that sounds kind of mathy. Um, but we will talk with students about the fact that there are quantitative reasoning courses in philosophy and in communications. Um, so there are lots of opportunities uh, for students to meet that requirement. All students in LSA must meet what is called fourth term proficiency in a second language. So your student has been asked to take a placement test and that helps us advisors understand and the student understand where to begin. Some students with no experience in a language will begin at the 100, the 101 level, and they'll take four terms in order to meet the college requirement. But if a student has experience in a language, they may place into second year language and have only two terms remaining. So we'll work with them during orientation to determine where to begin, what language they're interested in, all those questions we, we take on a student by student basis. All students must also take a race and ethnicity course. And there are plenty of those offered every term. So we help students identify the ones that they're most interested in. Okay. A good portion of a student's time at Michigan is spent in major requirements. Students typically declare a major at the beginning of their junior year and most majors, despite what you see here, um, require 30, 31, 32 credits of upper level coursework in a particular discipline. So history, for instance, if a student says, ah, I really gravitated toward history as a, a major, around junior year, they would declare history and then they would probably focus their last two years on upper level history requirements. That said, it is possible to keep taking classes um, that are electives or that meet distribution requirements throughout their four years. 
students, when they declare a major, can declare an honors major. And I will definitely talk about that um, in a few slides, or maybe the next slide. Uh, distribution. Distribution is our college word for broad liberal arts education. We know that students will eventually declare a major, but we wanna make sure that they're getting a really broad education outside of that discipline so that not all of their interests end up in the one department or two departments. So every student must take seven credits each of humanities, social science and natural science credit outside of their major department. And then they must choose nine additional credits in those categories or in creative expression, mathematical and symbolical analysis or interdisciplinary courses also outside of their major department. A lot of what we'll talk about with students during orientation are courses that meet distribution. Not because we think that students need to get that done and get it out of the way, but because it's exciting and it's the heart of a liberal arts education and we're helping students think about how those requirements line up for them. Finally, the remainder of a student's focus academically in their four years will be on electives in order to earn the 120 credits required for graduation. Many students will organize their electives into a second major, especially if they have an interest that is that deep in another subject or minor. We have over 100 minors in the College of LSA and sometimes students will just take randomly interesting courses because they want to learn the material or build a skill or have a second course with a faculty member they, they really enjoyed getting to know, you know earlier on in their career. So that's sort of the breakdown of what a student will do time-wise. There is a question in the Q&A, can a student test out of a second language? Yes. Student may take a placement exam and test out of a second language. Um, they may earn AP or IB credit that places them out of a second language. Um, and there are some other ways that a student may test out of a, a second language um, that we could talk about in more detail if that, that's important. Okay more on our program. And this is where I think Estrella is gonna have a lot to say. Um, we consider ourselves a four-year program, but broken into two phases, perhaps, is an easy way to think about it. And the focus of our presentation today will really be on the learning community phase, the first and second year. I will talk about the third and fourth year, um, but not in as much detail because It'll be a couple of years before your students are thinking about that. So the learning community phase, we are the largest living and learning community at the University of Michigan. Um, students, as I said, enter via an admissions process and our cohorts generally are around 400 students each year. We manage the admissions cycle very carefully um, for a couple of reasons, which I will describe. This year, our cohort is 430 students strong, and there is no cause for concern that we have 30 more than what I've said is our average. We plan our incoming class so that we can offer housing. Uh, we don't guarantee housing spaces, but we, we never want to admit a cohort that is larger than any housing that we could offer. Um, and we also want to make sure that students get access to the best advising possible. So we want to keep our cohorts small. Um, we also tailor our curriculum to our cohort so that students have an opportunity to take the classes that they're interested in. There will be some challenges to getting every class a student wants, and I'll come back to that, but um, we, we think very carefully about the number of students we admit relative to housing, advising, and the curriculum. Question, how frequently do students meet with advisors? The quick answer is as frequently as they like. And sometimes we'd like to see them more often, but I'll definitely come back to that one. And if I don't, please nudge me. So in the learning community phase, we offer our own curriculum and we call it the honors core curriculum. And I've already talked about the fact that 
we offer first year writing that is exclusive to honors students. Um, no non honor student is eligible to take our first year writing courses. And those courses carry distribution. All of our core courses, whether they're first year writing or not, carry distribution credit. We also offer honors housing in South Quad. As I said, we don't guarantee housing and it is optional, but it's a great experience. And I'm gonna ask Australia to chime in, but the reason I'll say that it's not required is because we, we often see students who are participating in another living and learning community. And if it's a smaller living and learning community, they may have a housing requirement. You know, you must live in Alice Lloyd Hall or you must live in this other residence hall. And so we want students to have the option to do that and also participate in the honors program. So no matter where a student is required to live or wants to live, they're always included in our community, our activities, you name it. Straya, do you wanna say a couple of words about honors housing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as it's been said, uh, most honors students live in South Quad. South Quad has a really great location. I'd say it's about five minutes walking from the Diag. It's one of the dorms which has a dining hall inside of it. So extra convenient in those Midwestern winters. Um, but of course, if you're a child for whatever reason is not living in South Quad, uh, that's totally fine as well. I remember one student did not live in South Quad because she wanted to live with a friend who wasn't in honors. And she decided that, that was more important to her being with a friend from high school. And so I lived over in Mary Markley, which is a dorm on the other side of campus. And it was just fine. I would see her in classes and I would see her at events. And uh, she certainly didn't feel like she wasn't part of the honors community. Uh, most students do not live in South Quad their sophomore year, even if they are sticking around for honors, just because that's a trend across the university. Uh, I believe it's around 70, 80% of students who are sophomores are choosing to live off of campus whether that's because they're in a fraternity or sorority or because they're just looking for a campus apartment to be with more people or just for less money, right? Um, but honors housing is available for those first two years. And after that, being an RA residential advisor is also a really cool opportunity that honor students can apply to be an honors RA or just a general one as well. Thank you. Um, we plan a lot of community building activities especially designed for students in their first and second year, but open to all students in their third and fourth year, um, including some they're open to alums, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Community is really important to us. Um, we know that Michigan is a very large university and that the college itself is very large, so we like to make honors feel like a community home where you recognize someone from your classes, where you might see them in the hall in South Quad or you know just crossing campus. Um, some of our activities are pure fun, and we'll talk about those soon. Some of them are more co-curricular, um, and that might include you know going to a performance um, as a group and then talking about it with a faculty member. Um, so I'll come back to that soon. The Sophomore Honors Award is an award that celebrates and rec what recognizes and celebrates a student's deep engagement with our learning community phase. That means they are taking the best advantage of our core curriculum and they are also participating in activities. The Honors Major and the Honors and Engaged Liberal Arts or HELA plans are ways of staying in the honors program beyond the second year. Once a student begins to identify their major area of interest, they can declare the major, um, but what we hope is that they will declare an honors major rather than just a straight major in the department. Or, And what I mean by that is, let's imagine a student um, wants to be a French major, um, rather than saying, I just wanna take 32 more credits of upper level French, they will express an interest in writing a thesis in French, contributing to the body of knowledge um, within French studies um, through independent research and then writing a, a monograph by the end of their senior year. There is no thesis in honors mathematics. There is additional upper level coursework. Um, some departments do have additional required courses in the junior and senior year, but those courses are almost always geared 
toward facilitating the research that goes into a thesis and then the writing of a thesis. And they're often cohort based so that a student doesn't feel alone in the process of writing this independent, um, you know, monograph. Honors in the Engaged Liberal Arts, or HELA, is a newer way of staying in the honors program for the third and fourth year. It is an extended community-based engagement project that takes the place of a thesis, as the slide says. So rather than write a monograph, a student would produce a project and make a presentation about it. One way of thinking about HELA is to think of it as a community-based problem-solving project or asset-enhancing project. We know that students come to Michigan with commitments from their home communities, or they come to campus and they develop some commitments um, in our local community. They identify problems, they understand what some assets are, and they want to make those assets more accessible to a large number of people. Um, and so students who are interested in pursuing the project can pursue the HELA route. Uh, their academic coursework informs their thinking about the project, but their co-curricular experience equally informs it. So it's really a way of making a change in the world and graduating with honors. Okay, minimum requirements for honors. We ask that students maintain a cumulative GPA of 3.4. And I'll pause here and I'll say that every semester at the end of this, the regular semester, fall and winter, we do an academic review, which means we are looking at every single student in the honors program. And we're, we're looking for information. Is the student flourishing? Now, we understand that grades, the GPA, is a pretty noisy signal. It does not represent the entirety of a student's experience at the university or in our program, but it's one indicator. And the reason that I really appreciate the academic review process is because it means that in as large a program as we are, no student falls through the cracks. Every student's performance is, is identified at the end of each term. For students who are flourishing, we send them notes of congratulations. Keep up the good work. We're really proud of you. Uh, for students who may not be flourishing at the level that they had hoped, we will reach out to them with any number of recommendations um, for you know, improving and making their experience better. It could be, you might want to come in and see us so we can talk about some strategies in this particular area. It might be, please come in and see us. We really wanna help you improve for the winter term. Never punitive, always supportive. The goal is to make sure students are really thriving in LSA. Um, I've already talked about the fact that we offer an honors core first year writing course. Um, and I have already talked about the honors major with the exception of mentioning some honors majors do have a slightly higher GPA requirement. And we advisors would help a student identify when that's the case. Okay, honors core courses, as I mentioned earlier, designed exclusively for honors program students. We invite the most talented faculty from across the university, primarily from within LSA, um, to design courses, especially for honors students, and they're taught on a three-year rotation basis. The courses are, the honors program serves as a laboratory for innovation um, in the liberal arts. And so we get some of the best classes um, for three years. Each course meets a distribution requirement. And even if a, if a course um, carries a specific distribution designation such as social science, it will always involve elements from other disciplines. Um, we're not strict disciplinarians in, in the intellectual academic sense. We like that broad liberal arts um, stretch. So as an example, I will say our honors core first year writing course called Wellness carries social science credit, but will include elements of the humanities um, and 
other disciplines as well. So there are some examples given on the, the bottom of the slide here. I'll pull out the first one. What is cancer? Uh, your student may have seen this course advertised in materials. And it's, a, it's been an extraordinarily popular class, but it has just been sunsetted and the faculty member has gone on sabbatical. So it will not be on offer this year and probably not on offer in the next year. But what we see often is that a course that has um, been very much enjoyed by honor students will pop up again in the LSA curriculum in a slightly different, more general format. Um, for instance, in the biology department. We are offering the corporation this fall and we are offering Westworld and the philosophy of mind in the winter of this year. And great books is always a fall course. It is our oldest um, core first year writing course. I think it's been on our books, um, pun intended, for about 60 years. The Sophomore Honors Award. The Sophomore Honors Award, as I mentioned, recognizes students who have really made the most of the lower division or learning community phase of honors. They need to earn 30 engagement points, which I will talk about. Um, they must have taken an honors core class meeting the first year writing requirement. And despite its name, a student actually has two years to complete the first year writing requirement. Now we do encourage them to, to take the first year writing course as early as possible. But for some students, it just doesn't work out or they find one that's more appealing in the winter. So we two years to meet that requirement. But the student pursuing the sophomore honors award would then need to take two additional core courses for a total of three in two different distribution areas. And again, that's the heart of the liberal arts. We want the breadth there, um, but within our core curriculum. And the minimum GPA requirement is our honors program minimum requirement, all classes taken for a grade. The award with distinction is very similar, 30 engagement points, first year writing core course. In this case, two additional core courses in three different distribution areas, so even more breadth um, and a slightly higher GPA minimum. These honors engagement points, what are they? The easiest way for a student to earn engagement points is by taking honors courses. Um, for every honors core course or honors section of a course or converted course, which I will describe momentarily, uh, one point is assigned for every credit the course carries. So all honors core courses are four credits, meaning they would earn four engagement points. The same would be true of honors physics, four credits, four points. Um, as long as a course is not taken on a pass fail basis, um, a student can earn engagement points. So there are departmentally designed honors alternatives to introductory courses and honors physics, which I just mentioned is one of those. Um, instead of taking Psych 111, a student would elect Psych 114 for the Honors Introduction to Psychology. And there are a number of those which we help students identify um, during orientation and throughout their first two years. Um, there are advanced math options as well. And we will often connect students with ma Honors Math Advisors so that they get the best possible advising as to which math class they should take. Honor sections of regular introductory courses. We'll see a course such as WGS 222 or 240 or Econ 101. That course in itself is not an honors course, but a particular section of it will be reserved only for honor students. And I'll give an example, not on the slide here. This fall, Economics 101, section 313 is reserved only for honor students. And if a student completes that course, honors is put on their transcript under Econ 101. So that's an honors section of a regular introductory course. Organic chemistry, the way to make that honors is to participate in a structured study group. 
that's a wonderful experience because it gives a student a really small cohort to practice um, organic chemistry problems. Finally, advanced elections. Any first year student who takes a 300 or a 400 level course would earn engagement points no matter whether the course was designated as honors. We consider that an advanced election. Uh, 400 level courses are required for second year students. Um, there's a note there as well about language courses beyond the requirement. But I'll pause and say that honor students often thrive in 300 and 400 level courses. They bring in the will and the skills and the dedication to, um, to make an upper division course work very well. And oftentimes 300 and 400 level courses are simply topical as opposed to intensely more rigorous. So we say to a student, if you're really interested in this subject, go ahead and pursue a 300 or 400 level course. And we'll talk with them on a case by case basis about whether that's something they wanna do. More engagement point information, honors conversions. Now this is one I really wanna talk about because it's one of my favorite components of the honors program. If there is no honors section of course um, on the books. Let me give as an example, Sociology 101. Um, it's a large course. We know that honor students can often give more of their attention to a course than the syllabus suggests that they might need to do. We know that they want to extract more value out of that course than they might think originally that they would get. So they have the opportunity to approach a professor and ask to convert the course into an honors course. What that means is that the student and the faculty member negotiate a bit of extra work along the way. Um, it could be extra readings each week. It could be interviewing other professionals in the department. There are any number of um, additional types of work that might be proposed and agreed upon. At the end of the semester, the student sums up the extra learning. Very typically, we would see an extra paper or a longer paper, but there are some really creative examples um, of ways of summing up that extra work. Um, students have created study guides for others. They have developed a podcast series. Again, the, you know, the examples proliferate, um, but they sum up their learning at the end of the semester. But the key feature of a conversion is that the student meets with the faculty member on a regular basis, such as every two or three weeks. And what that means is there's 100 people in the lecture, automatically the conversion makes it a tutorial. It's a one-on-one -on -one experience with the faculty member. If there are a few students in the class that are in honors and would like to convert the class, it might be a a three student to one faculty member meeting, but it really does shrink the class into um, a tutorial format, which is why I think it's a beautiful experience. And Estrella, you converted courses. Would you mind saying something about conversions? So I did not actually convert courses, but I can speak to it for friends that have. Okay. Um, so one really common course to convert, it's one of the intro poli sci classes, the political science department requires that students take, I think, four um, intro level courses before they continue on to the higher level ones. And so actually a fair number of people that I know have converted those. And basically that means that you're meeting with a professor more often. Now, anyone can always talk to a professor during office hours. I highly encourage that. But doing it through honors means that the, you and the professor have time scheduled apart separately that you know that you're going to be able to have a deeper conversation with them. And so one friend, I think it was like gerrymandering or something like that. He wrote two or three extra smaller papers about that, dealing with statistics or pulling in other skills that he wouldn't have otherwise if he was just taking the standard 100 level. And so, yeah, that's definitely a great option. Um, but as you can see in the chat, I just took 300 level classes. Okay, thank you. The other way to earn engagement points is to participate in designated activities. And we will always advertise these activities to students. We've begun advertising them during orientation because some of them are happening right now. Our honors online Canvas course is subtitled the Digital Undergraduate. It's an opportunity for incoming students to talk amongst themselves and with a current student about what it means to be a digital citizen. 
Now we've all been online forever, it seems, um, but it gives students an extra opportunity to think about what does it mean to be online as a University of Michigan student? What kind of discourse are you facing when you get here? Um, other opportunities, honors reads. We're reading the Ministry for the Future this summer. Um, that is an opportunity to earn points. Taking other honors classes, such as Honors 170, participating in honor, honors film series, honors in the arts, which I um, coordinate. There are lots of other opportunities throughout the year to earn points. And so we'll be very explicit. Um, if you participate in this activity, you earn X number of points. Okay, are the courses that are listed as online now definitely going to be online next semester? Um, no, that is the short answer. The university is converting as many online courses as possible into in-person courses. There will be some that stay online and we recognize the benefit of that. Um, Students sometimes appreciate being able to listen to a lecture asynchronously and then going to a discussion section in person. Um, so we understand that, that there's a benefit, but we also understand that students very much appreciate a full in-person experience. Um, so some courses are currently being converted from online into in-person. Some will remain online and some will have a hybrid format. Um, I hope that answers the question. There's no way of knowing for sure which courses are changing, but what we advisors are saying during orientation to a student is keep an eye on your schedule, um, your email, um, and select courses at times that don't conflict in case you have the opportunity to go to class in person. So we're, we're aware of some of the challenges that might create and we're working on a case by case basis with that scheduling business. Honors community. Um, one thing that's special about the honors community is that we have a team of honors residential advisors. Now all residence halls will have residential advisors who help students acclimate to living in a residence hall. Um, but we have our own team, honors RAs is what we call them. And our honors RAs perform the regular functions of a resident advisor, but they also plan a lot of community activities. And these are ones that I said I would come back to. Some of them are pure fun. There might be a trip to the ice skating rink, a Tigers game, there might be a knitting club, regular series of meetings, an ice cream night, a film night. Um, Estrella, you could probably talk about this better than me. Um, but again, no matter where a student lives, in South Quad or out of South Quad, they are welcome to these community building activities. Do you wanna say a word? Yeah, absolutely. So I think my favorite ever honors event was going to go see um, the musical The Color Purple um, on Broadway in Detroit. I mean, it was my first time going to Broadway in Detroit and tickets for that, as you can imagine, are usually pretty expensive, uh, but it was only $5 because honor subsidized it. And so, um, but that's a very popular event every year, you know, excepting COVID, of course, there's been that the year after that was Aladdin, uh, which I didn't get to go to because they sold out really quickly. Am I bitter? No, not at all. Um, but Lisa, you really did get it. There's a lot of really popular events and students also plan things among themselves that are really popular. Like the dining halls will often do themed nights. And so one night it was like Guy Fieri Flavortown over at Mojo, Mosher Jordan, a different dorm. So a bunch of students went over and just went there in honors groups. So there's always things that are happening that are either really planned like Broadway and Detroit or just a bit more casual. Thank you. Other ways we initiate community in August, right before classes begin, the Friday before classes begin, we host honors kickoff and we're very pleased to have kickoff in person this year. Um, it'll be a large event. We'll invite the entire cohort to come together in a super large auditorium, um, the Powers Auditorium. And the day will begin with a talk among our director, Mika, and some current students, as well as some incoming students. 
And then students will break apart um, for lunch and there'll be some campus activities like a scavenger hunt. And the goal is for people to get to know one another. Now we know that housing move-in dates are still a little bit in question. We know that some students may have commitments in other areas like a different living and learning community you might have a, a scheduled event that day that they're required to attend. A student might need to take a very late placement exam. So kickoff is not required, but it is strongly encouraged because we really love to see everyone coming together for the first time um, and seeing the whole cohort together. Honors has its own commencement and award ceremonies. And these are really lovely special events. Um, we recognize everyone who has completed an honors major or a HELA project. We also recognize at our commencement ceremony, students who have earned the sophomore honors award, um, even though it was two years you know, before they graduated. Um, our graduation typically takes place on the Thursday before the giant ceremony in the big house. Um, but those are just delightful um, ways of recognizing the community that's been created you know, over the course of four years. Throughout the academic year, we host a series called Lunch with Honors. During the pandemic, it's been Zoom, no lunch, um, but we are hoping to return to the actual lunch series. We invite speakers from all walks of life. It could be um, a faculty member from a different school or college at Michigan. It could be an alum. It could be an author whose, whose book has just been published, but anyone you know um, that we think a student would like to meet with, we'll invite them to come in and literally have lunch and talk with a small group of students. Um, usually the, the group of students is no more than 25 people. So it's a great conversation with some impressive guests. Um, okay, other questions about housing or engagement. There was a question, but I think uh, Estrella or Shannon answered it. Thank you. Um, honors advising model. There isn't much left of our presentation, so I'll, um, I'll spend a few minutes talking about advising, FERPA, um, and then any questions that we haven't addressed. Honors advising. When your student comes to orientation, they are assigned an honors advisor. And as long as they are in the honors program, that advisor is assigned to them. Um, the goal is Continuity, we love building relationships with students from day one, learning what they're interested in, how we can best be of help to them, um, whether it's you know, goal setting or really technical course planning, that kind of thing. But students are free to make appointments with any advisor in the honors program. And there are a few reasons for that. One, we don't want a student to have to wait long at all to get an advising appointment. Two, we realize that some students develop good relationships with not their assigned advisor. So we're happy about that. As long as the student has a relationship with an advisor, that's what we're after. And three, we have pre-professional advisors, as I mentioned, sort of at the beginning of our presentation. So it would make great sense for a student to see me, for instance, as a general advisor, and then to go and see Stephanie Turbin, our pre-medical advisor. And it's welcome when they are doing that because they're getting the very best possible advice for their for their the spectrum of their academic interests um, and needs. We also, as I mentioned at the outset, have um, Henry as our director of the Office of National Scholarships and Fellowships. Now, we are college advisors. We work as a network with other advisors outside of honors. When a student declares a major or a minor, they're assigned a departmental advisor. And those advisors are departmental authorities. They're the specialists. They know every in and out of that particular program. So we will often say, I can help you with your college requirements and big picture questions and particular academic business that the college you know, asks you to do. But if you have a very specific question about which math class you'd like to take, you should touch base with your math advisor. Um, but we all are in contact, so we're all on the same page about a student's plan. The same is true about study abroad, financial aid, and career advising. There are specialists in 
study abroad and financial aid. And we always connect students to the right people so that they get the best, most authoritative answer. Um, so again, we work as a network and it's a nested relationship. Um, as long as the student's in honors, they'll always have an honors advisor, and then they'll just add additional advisors as they go through the program. There was a question earlier, how often does a student see their advisor? Definitely twice during orientation. Um, a student will meet with us, I think Estrella may have already answered this. Have you answered this, Greg or Shannon may have answered this, but they'll meet with a, uh, an academic advisor first thing on their second day of orientation. We'll talk about their interests, their course plans, their placement exams, all sorts of important details. Um, they will then meet with students. We call them academic peer advisors. They will then register for courses for the fall semester. And then they will meet with their academic advisor again in the afternoon to review the registration and talk about how it sets them up for the coming years at Michigan. So at least twice during orientation. And then a student is invited to see an advisor as often as they like. We really appreciate it when students come and see us for pre-registration advising before each term, but we welcome them more often. Um, we do not require students to come in um, unless there's a, a serious you know, academic trouble issue brewing, but um, it's in their best interest to develop a relationship with their advisor. That's my opinion. Okay, before we conclude, the essential information about the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Once a student turns 18 years old or attends class at university, their academic information, also known as their educational record, becomes their property and their property alone. And it is private to them. We cannot share their information with any other party than a student. Even tuition paying parents are ineligible to receive educational record information without the student's permission. So um, if, a, if you think that having a conversation with your student about how information will be shared um, is important, you may wanna talk with them this summer about FERPA. Um, an example may be helpful. If you were concerned about your student's performance in physics and you were to write to the honors address and say, I, I'm, I'm worried, I don't think that this physics class is going as well, everything else is fine, but I'm, I'm hearing bad things about physics. Is my student going to class? What kind of grade is the student getting? We could not share any information about that particular student's academic information unless the student had waived their rights through the FERPA waiver. Um, we encourage students to be forthcoming and share their information with their families. Um, but you, as I said, you may wanna discuss how that information sharing will transpire in the future um, early so that there's no delay in getting the information that you might need. The link here on the slide is to the FERPA waiver. Um, student would fill it out. The student may be very specific or very general. The student might say, you can share my educational record with anybody who asks. Or the student might say, I authorize exactly one advisor to share my academic information with only my mother. So it's the, the, the burden is on the student to waive their rights if they so choose. That said, um, we are always happy to take in questions and concerns. So if you were to worry about a student's academic um, engagement or performance, you might write to us and say, I'm concerned, um, what should we do? And we advisors would reach out to the student and say, hey, let's have a talk about how are, how are things going? Um, we definitely respond to, to concerns. It's just that we cannot share particular information back. The same is true of social concerns. If you were to worry that your student wasn't making friends, um, not really getting involved on campus, and you wanted to reach out to us, we would welcome that. I mean, we would reach out to the student and say, aha, there's some really cool things coming up. Why don't we see if you, you know, could attend in this week or next week? 
So we're happy to address concerns. It's just a matter of protecting the student's right to privacy unless the um, right to privacy has been waived. Okay, now we are five minutes past the hour, but I see there's a new question, so I definitely wanna answer it. If you have a general idea of what major you'd like to have, but you haven't announced it yet, can you still contact a departmental advisor? Yes, um, this is true both in the summer during orientation and during the academic year, although departmental advisors may be slightly less available during the summer. Um, they're certainly available during the academic year and reaching out is a great idea. Estrella is typing an answer and I'm curious as to what she would Yeah, say. I can just say it out loud then. Yeah, I highly encourage that. Um, I went to the history department and I, I did it immediately so I didn't need to, but museum studies was a minor that there was like a prereq class that I, that I had to take before I could declare it. Um, and I went to go talk to the advisor and the advisor really sold me on the department. Um, so much of, you know, students having a success in the department that I've seen has been how strong the relationships are with their advisors, with their professors. So going in and getting a vibe check of the department is really important. And I always encourage people to reach out. Um, there's a ton of information online, of course, but getting to actually talk to a person, maybe understanding some fine print that is kind of wacky, um, hugely important and not hard to make appointments at all. Um, you can just do that like by searching like sociology appointments and that's it. Thank you. Any other questions? Could you answer the language question again, please? I'm okay. Um, the language question being, can you place out of a second language? Um, yes. If that is the question, um, a student can take a placement exam and place out of a language completely. Um, a student may be asked to validate their placement exam results early in the fall, but that's a very easy process. Um, but that's one way of placing out of the language. A student might place, you know, further down the path and have fewer courses to take in order to achieve fourth term proficiency. Um, a student might earn AP or IB test credit um, so that they place out of the language requirement. And then we also have, um, a set of criteria that help us determine if a student has native proficiency such that they already have two languages and don't have to take a third. Although they're always welcome to take a third. Um, when will students know the results of their placement exams? Most of the placement exam emails, I think come back pretty quickly. Shannon, you may know more about this than me. Um, I will know the placement results on the day of this on the day that the student meets with me, um, as long as they've taken it within the recommended time frame. Um, in their pre orientation materials they're asked to take it, you know, within a certain time frame, and we have access to those results. And I see Shannon is typing an answer, thank you, because it's going to be a better and more specific answer than what I just gave. So while Shane is finishing that answer, um, there is a slide here, it's our final slide. What do we talk about in orientation? We ask students to think about exploring. Um, some students do come in with an interest. And so we say, let's have some targeted exploration, um, maybe leading towards a major, but maybe not. Um, sometimes a student will make great progress in prerequisites to a major, but other times it'll be progress on college requirements and distribution requirements. Almost nothing a student takes in his or her first year will be wasted. It will either meet a requirement or it will put them on the path towards choosing a major or it will just be learning for learning's sake. And so there, you can almost hardly go wrong with a first year schedule. Um, so we do think about sequencing of courses. Um, we talk about very specific matters, you know, language as we've just been discussing, what needs to be done if you are majoring in something that has a very carefully sequenced set of steps. Um, we do steer students away from the checklist. 
I always advise students to find some joy in their fall schedule because we, what I know or believe to be true is that the happier a student is, the more interested a student is in what they're doing, the better they will do. So we ask them to think, yes, there are some requirements, but what makes you happy? How can we make your fall semester very successful for you? What will make you flourish here at Michigan? Question, some classes have already been filled by students from the earlier orientation sessions. How likely is it to get into those classes um, for those who are on wait list? Um, that is true. Wait listing is a great idea. We do see a lot of movement on wait lists throughout the summer. It will depend a bit on what position on the wait list a student is. And we can advise on that. You know, a student who is number 30 on the wait list, we would advise, let's plan a backup. A student who is number two on the wait list, we would say waiting is a great idea. Um, a student can alter their schedule throughout the summer after they register tomorrow. And they can switch things in and out. They can alter it even in the beginning days of the semester. So we do see movement on wait lists. Um, and we have plenty of first year writing seats in certain courses. Um, we have plenty of seats reserved for honor students in other courses. So we just talk really carefully with each student about what the best course of action is. To be on a wait list, choose backup, to plan for a course in the winter term as opposed to the fall term. Any other questions? Thank you for your patience. I realize I kept you way beyond the top of the hour. Um, I appreciate your joining us and I hope that tonight's session has been helpful. Thank you to Shannon and to Australia.